Good morning, Second Baptist Church. Happy anniversary! Yay! We're all together. We're gonna have fried chicken and other things. I'm excited. Um, if you are visiting with us today, lucky you, we're having a party. We would love if you would fill out a connection card that's located in the seat in front of you so we can know how to serve you better, minister to you better, just get to know you. We are continuing with our Wednesday nights. I am a little bit sad, I'm gonna miss this, so I expect all of you to go and give me a report. But David Cameron is going to lead an art walk through the church explaining the art, uh, explaining the art, the history of the art we have in this church. The art in this church is one thing that drew me to Second Baptist because it's such creative expressions of Christian ideas that you don't always see everywhere. So come for that, it will be a great experience. We'll also have fun activities for the kids. Church conference September 4th at 6 p.m. That is an important meeting to know what's going on in the life of our church. Please do come to that. And as I've already said, you can tell where my mind is, we will have lunch after service. Uh, you can look forward to my single mother salad that didn't come out of a bag at all. Um, <laughs> So uh, we are excited to celebrate with you today, and if you would please ready yourself for worship with me, the Lord be with you. together in our congregational invocation oh God for 66 years you have given nourishment to Second Baptist Church we bless you O oh Lord for all your goodness your blessings upon us are lavish beyond measure help us to make a place at your table for all your children on this anniversary of our church's birth 
Give us new vision to see the coming of your kingdom of love and justice into our midst. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Scripture reading for today is from Joshua 24, verses 1 and 2, and 14 through 18. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord for He is our God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, if all the children would come up and join me. Good 
crowd today. Can any of you tell me some things that were very hard for you to learn to do? Yes. Read. Read. Yes, that is a hard thing. Math. Yes. Climbing a ladder. Okay. Riding a bicycle? Kind of hard, wasn't it? Tying your shoes? Tying your shoes was really hard for me, I'm telling you. When you wanted to learn how to do something, was it so hard that you wanted to quit sometime? No? <laughs> Why? Because you really wanted to do it, right? You guess? <laughs> well, yeah, when you really want to do it, you keep trying, don't you? Till you get it. Well, in our scripture story today, Jesus tells us that he was talking to his disciples and he was trying to teach them how to follow him. Do you know what some of the disciples said? Exactly. It's too hard and they quit. Can you believe some of the disciples quit following Jesus because it was too hard? Yes, they gave up. You just have to pray. You're absolutely right. That's all you have to do. Jesus is there for us, isn't he? We, we learn a lot of things in church, don't we, about following Jesus, don't we? Yes, we do. And at school, too. Okay, yes. Not at your school. Well. <laughs> okay. So, but the important thing is not all of Jesus' disciples quit. They knew that what Jesus was telling them was the right thing. And they kept working and working until they understood. And do you know that in later stories, the Bible tells us that those disciples had learned what Jesus wanted, some of the things Jesus wanted them to learn. And they were able to help other people like us understand those hard things. So what I want you to remember today that we follow Jesus is the best thing to do and the best things will happen if we choose to follow Jesus. So will you pray with me? I want you to repeat after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for the disciples who never quit on Jesus and showed us what to expect when we keep following Jesus and learning about you. Thank you, God. Amen. All right, y'all may go to children's time. We're back with your parents.
As you're able, please rise for the gospel reading. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 56 through 69. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which the ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in a synagogue at Capernaum. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who were the ones who did not believe and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I started reading Christian theology in a more intentional, formal way uh, in college, uh, goodness, 45 years ago, the neo-Orthodox theologians made a big impact on me. Neo-Orthodoxy was a school of theological thought that took the tenets of the faith and applied them to a contemporary age. Uh, sometime later, when I became uh, part of this fellowship, that was a motto that we used to use, the faith for a contemporary age. Uh, the symbol of that faith, the, the atomic ichthus, the cross of Christ in a nuclear age. I believe that is just as relevant today as it was when this church started 66 years ago. Karl Barth, who I quote fairly frequently, probably was the premier theologian of the neo-Orthodox movement. But the one that made the biggest impact on me, perhaps, was Paul Tillich. He wrote a number of books. Uh, he had to flee Nazi Germany, came to this country. Uh, he was an exile in this country. He never held a formal professorship. He did teach at Harvard. He did teach at the University of Chicago. He was kind of a visiting professor status because he was a resident alien, which perhaps equipped him for this project of applying God's truth to the contemporary situation. He wrote a book entitled The Courage to Be, which rocked my world as a college student. What Paul Tillich did, some of you have read that book, I would strenuously recommend that we read that again. I know a number of our community groups read books and discuss it. It is a classic of the Christian faith. Paul Tillich analyzed anxiety in all its forms in our human existence. 
And he talked about the courage that we have to overcome that anxiety in Christ. And he ended that extended essay, The Courage to Be, Bread Fellowship read it not long ago. I'm trying to introduce these seminal teachers of the church to a new generation. He ended that book by saying, the courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. Because the God that disappears in the anxiety of our doubt is a God who is not worthy of our worship. The courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. We have many small gods in our culture today. And we sometimes are tempted to follow those false and small gods, aren't we? Or in an election year, and politicians might represent a small god. We get worked up about the politicians, don't we? Don't we? <laughs> politicians don't come to the scene to bring us together. Politicians come to the scene to tear us apart. And they particularly want you alienated from your neighbor. Politicians don't want you and me talking to our neighbors. Much less loving them. Politicians want us to listen to them. That's their project. And to deify a politician or to demonize a politician is kind of the same thing, isn't it? And so it might be a good exercise for us, particularly in this election year, to go find a dear friend who's going to vote opposite from the way you vote. Oh, the preacher has quit preaching and gone to meddling now. <laughs> And figure out what makes that person tick and why that dear friend is going to cast her vote opposite from you. How about the preachers? Preachers are small gods. Do not listen to any preacher anywhere that you do not know personally enough to come to you, hold your hand, give you a hug, and embrace you in prayer before the throne of God's grace. I'm going to say it again. Forsake all celebrity preachers. All of them. Lord, they're dropping like flies in Fort Worth, Dallas. Are y'all reading the headlines of the papers? And if there's ever a message of the Holy Spirit, it is that preachers are false gods. I've been conducting an informal poll. I've shared it with some of you. Somebody that I run into that goes to a mega church somewhere with 10,000 people, I ask, well, do you know the pastor? Oh, goodness. No. You mean you've never met him and it's always a him? Oh, no, no, no. I could never do that. You mean he doesn't know your name? Why no? And then that leads me to ask, are you a part of a Sunday school class? No. Well, are you faithful? Are you regular in the life of this church? Why, yes, I'm regular. I go three or four times a year. <laughs> My friends, this is American Gnosticism and the proponents of it and the preachers of it are small gods. Do not listen to any preacher anywhere, on the radio, on television, on podcasts. I know it's an outrageous statement. You test it. Who will not come to your home, hold your hand, and go to the Lord in prayer with you. It's not what preaching, according to the Bible, was designed to do. 
Which is why most of the time Jesus did it was with a small group, including the passage we have today. Your personal self, small God. We have the Gnosticism of our culture. Those who don't follow the politicians and those who don't follow the preachers follow their personal self, your best self now. Self-help is a whole publishing genre now. It didn't exist 50 years ago. Now we have a book on everything, a book on everything. Now we have thousands of books on everything about how we can look down within ourselves and find our inner truth and, you know, just follow your own heart. I'm going to tell you, sisters and brothers, the worst advice I have ever heard is to follow my own heart. <laughs> because the heart is deceitful above all things, we're told on good authority, and desperately wicked. The courage to be is rooted in a God who will appear to you when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. Joshua gathered all the tribes. Tom just read the story. You heard it with your own ears. All the elders, all the people at Shechem, they had crossed the Jordan River and they had conquered the land implausibly enough. And so they were on the high crest of the wave. They were on the mountaintop. And Joshua was afraid that they were going to camp out right there in all that euphoria. He gathered them all together and he reminded them this is the only place, the Deuteronomic tradition does not record this. He reminded them that their ancestors went after and followed false gods. The Deuteron Deuteronomic tradition has the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Joshua remembers for the people that they went back beyond that time when the polytheism existed along with this new monotheism, that's an interesting turn of the prism for me that while they are large and in charge, literally, militarily, now politically, they're about to form a monarchy. Joshua reminds them that they once followed and worshiped small gods. And then he says, choose this day Choose right now, this day, who you will serve. Right now, this very hour. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My dear friend, my dean at Mercer University, Alan Culpepper, teaches that this sixth chapter of John reflects sort of four different stages in the Johannine worshiping community. This is interesting to me. Alan's absolutely brilliant. If you're going to study the Gospel of John, you have to read Alan Culpepper's Anatomy of the Gospel. And we're at this phase in this. This is the fourth, the fourth straight week that the lectionary gives us John chapter 6 about the bread of life. And people are falling away now. And the Johannine church is old enough, it's the last gospel, and now the Christians have been separated from the synagogue and the Jewish community is persecuting the new Christians and the Christians are leaving in droves. And a lot, the text says, of the followers of Jesus are falling away. And Jesus asked Peter, what are you going to do? And Peter gives a wonderful reply. He says, where, do we, where are we supposed to go? To whom will we go? And then, according to John, 
Peter gives his confession very different from the synoptic gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he says you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In John he says you are the holy one of God in whom there is eternal life. I don't know how to or what to tell you to do going forward. I can look to the past and I can see the great things that God has done for 66 years. And I tend every Sunday, I have for the past year, rehearse those things. And it's been an interesting spiritual exercise for me to be with you this past year. It's been a good thing to give thanks to God for all of the chapters in this church's history and to celebrate the values of this church. It has been an immeasurably rich thing for me to help you say goodbye to many of our glorious saints in the life of this church this past year. I have their worship orders with their photographs. I love what you do. I have them all lined up on my desk and every Sunday I listen to them. And I ask them, what do we do now? Where do we go now? And I can't say that I have any specific ideas about that. But I know this, I know that whatever we become, whatever the future holds for us, that it will center on the Holy One of God in whom we have life. And for 50 plus weeks, I have tried to establish that center, to reconvene that center. And this has been a fascinating spiritual study for me because I have been an experience of security, of reaffirmation. I do love you. You know that. And I know that you love me. But y'all, I stand before you on this anniversary Sunday to say We've got to shed that security blanket. And I got most of my life and ministry behind me. And so do you. And what those friends are telling me. As they look at me on my desk is. The Holy One of God is going to take you into a purposeful future. Do not sacrifice that purposeful future on the pedestal of the past. When this church was started and we've got a portion of the very first sermon that our very first pastor preached in our order of worship, I call your attention to it. When this church was started, 66 years ago, we were a new thing. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Can you see it? And now we're no longer a new thing. But we can be. It's going to take courage, the courage to be. It's going to take courage to follow the God who appears when all of our small gods and all of our tokens and all of our, I don't know, graven images are lost in the anxiety of doubt. Before long, we will have a new pastor. This church is at a crossroads unlike, in my view, we have ever been before. Because never before have we suffered the ill effects of cultural cross currents and COVID. Friends, COVID has decimated the church. 
it is half the size that it was five years ago. Lots of analysis, lots of perspective, lots of theories about that. But we are at a crossroads. And I don't think our hope is found within ourselves, our personal selves. I don't think our hope is found within a preacher. I know it's not found in a political point of view. It is going to be found in the Holy One of God as that one becomes flesh in our lives. And as we gather together in hope, pursuing a purposeful future, nostalgia is the conclusion that God is not up to anything new. Remembrance, on the other hand, which is a word we have engraved on the salient symbol of this church. Remembrance, on the other hand, is getting remembered, put back together again. These planes need a progressive fellowship that believes in the centrality of God, which leads us to the equality of every single human being, which then propels us into a missional dynamic that makes a place at the table for every one of those people, regardless of who they are. And that is our mission. And that is an unfulfilled purpose for us. And I think I'm looking at people with the courage to be who are willing to say this day, as for me and my house, I will serve that Lord who has brought us safe thus far and will lead us safely home. Some years ago, I did a funeral for an old saint of the church in Kentucky, my first little pastorate. There were two of us, an elderly minister and myself. And we did the memorial service for a wonderful, dedicated member of the church in the Pauline sense of that term, member of the body of Christ. And so when he died, we thought we had lost a limb. He would come in the back of the West Point Baptist Church every Sunday, and he would take his farmer's hat, and he would put it on a peg on the back wall of the church. And the older preacher who shared that memorial service with me <coughs> preached a brilliant memorial message that day around the question, whose hat's gonna rest on that peg now? Whose hat will hang on that peg now? And that is the question for us this day. I believe we're going to successfully resolve this. I believe we are going to move dynamically, energetically into a purposeful future because I know you well enough to know that you follow the Holy One of God who gives you life, life without end. Oh God, we come to you as a unified church in this hour. No one deselecting at this moment. But your word in speech and in song unifying us into this time of resolution. This time of rededication. We're not going to go back. We're going to move forward. 
but we don't know what that looks like. And so we are in you. We have the courage to be in you and the courage to become who you want us to be. Oh God, let that happen. And we'll give you all the honor and all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We are about to sing a hymn of response. If today you would confess Jesus as your Christ, as your Holy One, One, the One, the only One for you. I invite you on behalf of this fellowship to come. Let me extend the hand of friendship and fellowship and membership to you on behalf of this faith community. If you have placed your faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit is leading you now to join this church and move into the future with this fellowship, please come. There is a place of service for you this day and on the journey ahead. The invitation is extended. Let us respond as we stand and sing. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing all of us to gather here today to give to you, to give thanks to you, and to serve you. Let this be an afternoon and a day where we reflect on all of the years that you have blessed upon this church. And let this also be a day where we all reflect on the ways that you have worked and are continuing to work in the lives of everyone in this church both individually and collectively. 
Help us never to lose sight, Lord, that we are here and only here to serve and be present for a God who is always there, who is always present, and who is always good, even in times of insurmountable anxiety or doubt. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for all of us, for everything that you have done and will continue to do. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
invite the Smith family up. to get to be a part of this baby dedication. And um, I wanna introduce you to your church family, Graham. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Let's go, you wanna? <laughs> we're, a, we're a fun bunch, Graham. <laughs> So, do you want to come say hi to me? Yeah? Oh, goodness. Yes, yes. Beautiful. Mom, you want Mama to come? Oh. You want to come? Do you want to, do you want to walk? you want to walk? Walk with us. You want to walk? Will you hold my hand? <gasps> yeah. Woo! So I know, this is what I can tell you, Graham, about this church family. They know how to have fun. And they know that following Jesus is fun. And it's better when we do it together. And they're gonna be here when you want to Relax and let people carry you. <laughs> They're going to be here maybe when things are hard and it's tiring. Yeah. Look at all these friends. They want to be here with you to play basketball and look at fish and all the things we've gotten to do together. And you know, the most important thing is they want to show you how to walk with Jesus and also go back to mama sometimes. <laughs> but this is your church family, Graham. And we're going to support you and we're going to support your family to do this life together. Okay? So happy you're here. All right. Can you give me a high five? Good job, buddy. We did it. Yes, sir. Will y'all please join me in our litany of dedication? Allie and Cameron, your primary responsibility is to reflect God's love to Graham through your words and actions. As you come to dedicate your son to God, what promise do you make? What do we, the people of God, Second Baptist Church, believe about all children? We believe in each child is the creation of God and made in God's image. We take pride in each child as God's gift to us. What commitments do we make to the Smith family? We promise to surround them with love, to be their family in Christ, and to help them disciple and nurture Christ. What is our hope for Graham? We look, we look forward, forward to the day when he will declare his faith in Jesus Christ, gather with us at the Lord's table, and serve Christ through the church. May he may come to know that as a child of God, he belongs to Christ and to us, the family of faith. Here's a gift from your church family. Graham, you want to open that? You have one, I promise. <laughs> yes. Look, Graham. Yay. It's 
it's your New Testament. Will y'all please join me in prayer? Gracious Father, I ask your blessing today on Graham, the Smith family, and the church family of Second Baptist. Thank you for this day of reminder that we are called to come to you as your children and serve and support each other as your family. Let it begin in our hearts and bear fruit in our actions through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Kyle, come and stand beside me. Cindy, come and stand beside your man. <laughs> Kyle unites with our church. He comes from another tradition. Uh, it, he has been here for a number of years. He and Cindy have been married for a number of years. Cindy, of course, knowing this church very well, very intimately, having held membership uh, a long time ago. and. Life's journey took them to some other places and now back to Second B uh, long before I arrived back here and Kyle unites with our church today. This is a prayerful decision. It's an intentional decision. It's a decision that we have discussed and, and uh, deliberated and so Kyle's counting the cost of this discipleship and we sure are glad. Congregation, welcome Kyle into our fellowship. And then the wards, James and Jennifer, come and stand beside me, please. Unite with our church from a, another church in our city, a church that you would know, but I'm not going to mention it. Some of you may know South Crest Baptist for all I know. <laughs> and they come uniting with our church, and I hope I wasn't out of line in that, but I uh, think it was good for these people to know that. The wards are, have been here, they have been watching us, and they have been observing you, and they have been worshiping God with us. James is a psychologist. Jennifer is a physician, a pediatrician, Jennifer. The family medicine, close. So Dr. Jennifer and James, this fine couple uniting with our church, and let's tell this couple how glad we are that they are now in our fellowship. And I'm going to ask, uh, after we pass the peace of Christ, Tim, is it okay if we just stand here? Is this okay to give the benediction here? And uh, give, uh, give us directions for the lunch. Just a couple of things. You're going to, after we're, you're served all along in here and we'll make our way out, you'll find tables in the Grand Hall, of course, the foyer. The youth room has some tables in it. Um, there are also a couple of tables outside if you choose that. I know there are a water there's a water slide or two for children, or I guess there's no age limit at your own risk. <laughs> um, but we will need, after we um, finish our service in just a moment, we'll need five or 10 minutes as the last things are brought out, and then we'll kind of form a line right back here, um, and then we'll make our way this way, excuse me, around the room. So let's stand together and pass the peace of Christ to one another.
the goodness of God, we were born into this world. By the grace of God, we have been kept all the day long and even until this very moment and by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus. We are being redeemed. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.